Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to take the time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey Campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Thank you for joining us for this lecture today. This is our third invited speakers meeting of the Catalyst program. It's also the first occasion on which we have the privilege of two distinguished guests, Professors Nicholas Koops and Laurie Daniels, well-known commentators on the relation between climate change and the forest fire hazard. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to remind you of some housekeeping notes. The first half of the event will be a presentation by one of the speakers. Following this, we will have a Q&A. Uh, following the second speaker, we will have a Q&A session. People in the audience in person can raise their hand during the Q&A if they have a question. People on Zoom, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Your questions will be asked on behalf of you by me. If there are any technical issues, please write your question in the chat box. So it's my pleasure to introduce the first of our speakers, Nicholas Koops, Professor in the Faculty of Forestry at UBC and a Canada Research Chairholder, Tier 1 in Remote Sensing. Nicholas is the head of the Integrated Remote Sensing Studio, IRSS, within the Faculty of Forestry at UBC a research lab at UBC investigating and demonstrating applications of remote sensing data to environmental and forest production issues. He has published over 520 peer-reviewed journal papers. I'm amazed you managed to count them all. <laughs> and was the editor-in-chief of the Canadian Journal of Remote Sensing for a decade. Nicholas was awarded a Killam Research Scholarship, the Carl Pulfrich Award, sponsored by Leica, and silver and gold medals by the Canadian Remote Sensing Society Award, which is the highest award for a mid-career and senior scholar in remote sensing in Canada. In 2020, Nicholas was a joint winner of the Marcus Wallenberg Prize, known as the Nobel Prize in Forestry, for his research into satellite analysis a numerical modeling of tree and forest growth. We're so pleased to see you here, Nicholas. Thank you for coming. The title of this talk is Digital Forest Ecosystems, New Sensors and Data for Addressing Climate Change in Canadian Forests. Thank you. Thank you. Do we need to share the screen or you're going to, you'll do that. Perfect. So thanks everyone for coming online and many thanks for people attending in person. Um, that last thing about winning the Marcus Wallenberg prize, I was in Sweden in October and met the King of Sweden as part of the award that was an extraordinarily formal and um, one, once in a lifetime achievement, which I'm uh, enormously grateful. So I can tell stories about that experience uh, in time. So um, when Olaf asked me to speak, I, I, don't, I don't think of myself as a climate change researcher. I develop and use technologies that help us think about how the planet is changing in response to climate change. And I told that to Olaf and he still assured me that would be of interest to the crowd here and the crowd online. So I wanted to give you a sense perhaps of two ways we're using remote sensing imagery to look at issues of our planet that I think are really exciting and perhaps things that have started to happen in the last five years or so. There are about 250 satellites that go over Vancouver every single day that look at our planet and how it's changing. So a lot of our satellites are obviously from NASA, uh, but many nations in the world now have very robust remote sensing programs. Virtually every nation will have a robust remote sensing program. Uh, NASA, Americans are obviously the leaders. The Europeans have done a significant job in terms of producing a European-wide satellite network called Copernicus, uh, which is many satellites now 
Uh, and then there are, of course, um, the Japanese, the Chinese, uh, Indians to Pakistanis, uh, there's the Brazilians, there's many, many countries that are now developing and, and building their own remote sensing programs, including Canada. But Canada's remote sensing satellites are pretty much dedicated to snow and ice and very much around the melting of uh, the, the freeze-thaw cycle of ice in the Great Lakes and in the Arctic. And so I, as a forestry researcher, don't actually use satellite, uh, Canadian satellites that much, rather I use satellites from uh, America and Europe. But we are a remote sensing country as well in Canada with a lot of our satellites built by MDA down near the airport. That's the, the poster child of um, Earth-based satellites designed to see how the Earth is changing is the Landsat program. It was the first satellite ever launched dedicated to look at land, Landsat. The first one launched in 1972. And we have had a Landsat satellite that goes over the Earth every single day, not every single day, a Landsat satellite that goes over Vancouver since then through to today. We're up to Landsat 9. So this is an extraordinary archive of satellite data that we've had. Landsat went through some real ups and downs through its history. It got commercialized under Reagan uh, and then actually went bankrupt and came back into the US government in the late 1980s. During the um, economic downturn in 2008, the Americans gave a lot of money to the USGS to bring all the Landsat data from all around the world back to US servers and processed it to a very high level of quality and gave it out for free. So from 1972 through to about 2008, we were paying for Landsat imagery. But from around 2008 on, it's been free and it's completely revolutionized the way we do Earth-based remote sensing. This was the number of scenes that were downloaded in 2008, just before they became free. And this has been the uptake in the downloading of Landsat data since. There was more data downloaded in the first month that was free than had ever been bought in the previous 35 years. So this ability to use imagery that is free and open has really changed the way we think about how we can process data. And this now is the, the building of the archive as more and more satellite imagery is being brought into the archive from this one particular satellite since that time. So when I did my master's in remote sensing, I was given a scene. That's how we used to cut up remote sensing imagery as an image, like a postage stamp. And you would buy the postage stamp. But now when I think about change, well, in those days when we thought about change, you would then go and get multiple images and subtract them to go and give you information about change because I had to buy each one of these Landsat scenes. But now Landsat data is free. So now we don't think about buying a scene, we think about a pixel. A pixel is 30 meters by 30 meters. And what I do is I take the first pixel, if one and I said two, and I take every single pixel to do that. And I don't worry about scenes. I don't worry about buying an image. I just download a pixel over time which has completely redefined the way we think about change. How is the planet changing? How's the forest changing? I don't do differencing anymore. We now think about change in our forests, change in agriculture, change in snow and ice, change in urban by being a process that's happening over time that we're able to go and measure as often as we can that we can extract from the image database. So this has sort of changed the way we think about data. So this is Saskatchewan. If I want to go away and make a composite of what Landsat looks like of Saskatchewan for one year, there's going to be clouds everywhere. But rather than having to worry about, okay, well, I have to get this scene from here and this scene, try to stick them together. Now I just simply say, look at every single pixel. Every single pixel that was ever collected over Saskatchewan for the year 2000, I rank each pixel, which one's the best one, and I can go and make extraordinary composites of the planet, which are now completely cloud free. This is the image from Saskatchewan. This is over a summit, not one image, many images all stacked together. This is all the numbers of different images I could go and pick to go, and, uh, to go away and make that composite image. So I'm able to go away and build these global mosaics of the world, filling in data gaps much more easily because I'm able to go and use the entire archive, terabytes and terabytes of data, rather than just one individual image. 
And for Canada, it allows us to go away and do change. So this is Saskatchewan once a year, every single year, using all the image from the entire archive. Obviously, if I've got a an area over time, I check every single pixel. How much light am I getting off that? I might have a pixel there. There's actually no change. I can very easily go and find noise because I can use the temporal series rather than just single images. But in climate change, the key thing here is to go and think about change in the landscape itself. I can go and map change much more easily because I'm looking at what's happening over time. So I can do this. Now, I'm surprised there wasn't a gasp, so I'll, I'll do this again. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is 30 meter. If I zoom this in, I will get to 30 meters by 30 meters. This is 350 gigabytes of data. This is run on Compute Canada. We produce this every single year. So this is an extraordinary Canada-wide mosaic of what the country now looks like, but at that very, very, very fine scale, 30 meters by 30 meters. So these take a long time to process. This is 73,544 images that are free and open that I just download from the, uh, the US databases. So we're able to do analysis that we couldn't do before. We could do it on a scene by scene basis before, but now I can go and do it Canada wide. I can go away and say, how many pixels exhibited this behavior? And I get this. So this is all the pixels across Canada that exhibited a change in greenness. So it was green and then not green anymore. So it could be harvest or fire or insect or urbanization or clearing or oil and gas. This is the pattern that we get colored by year. So Laurie's gonna tell us about, well, all of this is fire, our boreal fires that we have very large fires that just burn throughout the year as part of the normal ecology. Here I'll show you is mountain pine beetle, and all the way down here is the harvesting that we have as part of our forest industry. Hard to see at that scale, so I thought I'd do you a nice geographic tour. This is New Brunswick. I've got an image changing every single year from my Canada-wide mosaic, and this is my detection of each pixel where I've coloured it by year. So I talk to my students in class and I say, what can you see here? What do you think this is? So I would say, well, it's pretty regular, it's square, everything's done in one particular year, it's not particularly mosaic, it's in New Brunswick. I try to bring in a bit of social science by saying that land ownership in New Brunswick reflects some of the European settlement with long, thin paddocks, long, thin ownership. So this is actually harvesting occurring as these different um, forest owners are harvesting a block of forest each year and it reads right there, harvest the one next to it. Compare that to Manitoba. So this is obviously not harvesting. This is massive fires that we let burn. There's no danger to people. There's no danger to property. So these are a natural part of the ecosystem. I can go and map all the fires we have across Canada using this satellite over this period. We can keep going. Alberta, the poster child of how not to look after Alaska. So here we have here a whole stack of different disturbances. So this is harvesting which they mimic as fire to try to represent natural process. So you can see the boundary of where they harvest is similar to the size of the fires that we saw in Manitoba, and then they do a patchwork. They harvest some for one year and then come back a few years later and do the next one. So you get a hair and bone, and then look at this. This is all the roads, and at every single end of the road is a square, which is where the, the oil pump is pulling out the oil from the land, as well as a little bit of fire. And then, of course, British Columbia, we have this type of disturbance. We have not harvesting, of course, but this type of disturbance, which is mountain pine beetle. So it's harder for me to see insects because I don't get that huge drop in greenness. If we go and drive and we look at mountain pine beetle, the forest looks red, but there's still green trees. That's tough for me to see from space what's causing that disturbance. But you can see the beetle is much more sort of uh, splodgy over the landscape. Technical term, splodgy over the landscape, lumpy, contagious, that sort of pattern that we get a bit of harvesting you can see happening overall. So it's extraordinary. Landsat is very accurate at giving me the date of the change. So I'm showing you this change by year. If we go and do a census across the country, we compare the date that Landsat said something happened versus the date it actually happened. We are within one year. So this is a very accurate way of thinking about change. If we know the change, we can then think about land cover, which is an important climate change variable. 
Is it broadleaf forest? Is it conifer forest? Is it crops? Is it pasture? Is it snow and ice? So traditionally, you would go and get an image and you'd make a map. You get another image, make a map. Get another image and make a map. But your error compounds when you do that, especially when you go in difference length. The idea now is think about change. If there's been a disturbance and there's been a fire, what has to come next? Well, either it stays dirt or eventually it becomes shrubs, eventually it becomes forest. So there's a trajectory that you know will happen in that particular pixel and you model it as probabilities of happening. And so you can actually build these land cover maps every year that are consistent. You don't have pixels jumping from broadly forest to clear to evergreen forest or something, which was what you get when you had error. The classifications we're now producing are much more robust and sensible over time, producing this, which looks like that image before, but now it's actually land cover, and now the land cover is changing. And really what you're seeing here is just the, the fire burning down and getting grass and then shrubs and then forest again, so we sort of see that sort of stuff. And we do this globally. So I don't do this globally because I'm not a global land cover mapper. But this is now the process we use with the European Space Agency and with NASA. We don't go and do single one-off classifications now on different images. We think about the stack. So this revolution has occurred in 10 years because 2008 was only the first time the data became available. And the Europeans were not particularly keen on free and open data uh, for a variety of reasons. They've got their own competitive space industries and different nations and different space organisations. But in the end, it forced them to be free and open. And now all of the data we can use for this type of stuff is free and open. So I've got a Landsat going over every 16 days, and there's two of them. I've got two um, European satellites called Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-2A and 2B. They go over every eight days. So every three days now. I can see this from space, all of these satellites working together. And the Europeans and the Americans produce one product that we can use. So pretty extraordinary data processing and, and insights around land cover that we've seen, which is very, very new and pretty exciting. And Canada is a leader in the development of the methods. We don't really do global. There are some groups across Canada that do global. I don't do global. But, you know, this, this idea of the methods and how you do these methods is something that, that um, you know, we have been helping contribute to. So, exciting. Perhaps the other revolution in remote sensing that we've seen in the last five years is drones. So drones maybe have a bad rap. I don't know how you feel about drones, but uh, drones 10 years ago, I would have thought I wouldn't put a send in them. They're a simple Radio Shack Mickey Mouse thing that a teenager is going to play with and I would never use a drone in a serious remote sensing lab. And that's what I would have thought 10 years ago. It's probably what I probably thought five years ago. Now, drones have revolutionised the way we are doing work in forestry. It's a variety of reasons. Miniaturisation. So miniaturisation has massively resulted in drones having much more power and payload than ever before. So this drone is carrying about three or four kilos, whereas a few years ago, we would never have been able to carry that sort of weight. And when I'm talking about a three kilo payload, I'm able to put things on that that I've never been able to do before. Technologies like LiDAR and hyperspectral, which are fancy remote sensing technologies, but things that I've never been able to put in the drone before. Coupled with that is safety. These things are completely um, designed around safety. So the wind speed gets too much, it comes back home. If it's going to run out of power, it comes back home. It knows where it always has to come away and land. So they're very intelligent and they're very programmable. And any student can get their license. There's an online test. And then if they're a foreign student, there's an in-person pilot test they need to do. But then any student can go and fly a drone like this as well. The benefit of drones is the level of detail. There's no way I'm going to fly Canada with drones. A drone can stay in the air for 30 minutes. A drone can fly 100 hectares. So if I put a drone in the air over UBC, I probably could get UBC done in a day. So I'm not going to be flying Canada with drones anytime soon. But I can fly high value forest. I can fly forest that's really important that I need information about the state of that resource. I can fly a fire. I could fly a biodiversity area. I could fly part of a national park. I could fly some forest plots that I know that I'm going to come back and measure. So it's a way of collecting extraordinarily dense data, but only small areas. One of the key benefits of drones is that I can take thousands and thousands of pictures. And it's revolutionized this 
the photogrammetry, which is in fact a relative or very old remote sensing science, but now we do it digitally. Imagine taking a photograph of a forest, of a tree, but I'm taking many photographs, 20 photographs of that particular cup of water. I'm moving over, because I'm taking many different perspectives, I can build a 3D model of that glass of water simply by using photographs. That's called photogrammetry. So I can do that. The benefit of drones is, as long as I'm flying like this, I can take a thousand photographs, just the size of the memory card. So I can actually saturate that glass with lots and lots of photographs, keep me lots of different angles. And now we have software that simply brings those photographs in and gives you a point cloud. So this is a forest that's been flown by a drone where all those pixels have been matched to go and give me what the forest looks like in extraordinary detail. The cool thing is I can take thousands of photographs. So I tell the drone when it goes up in the air to take as many photographs as you possibly can. They all have extraordinary overlap. So they're, these are only moving very slightly as I'm taking more and more of them. And it gives me data like this. This is an air photo of a forest from the interior. This is what I see from the drone. I take all those photographs into the software. The software goes and reconstructs every single tree and gives me a three-dimensional model of the forest, which is that. That is a computer generated model of the forest from the drone imagery. So I'm looking at photographs. I'm actually looking at a model where I can then pull out every tree, literally drag it out of that image, stick the tree, and then go away and do analysis of that tree. So we ask questions like what's the branching structure? What's the biodiversity value? We do it for um, genetics trials around improving Douglas fir in terms of the, um, the properties of the structure of the tree itself. And I'll end, when I do end, I'll also show you some examples of fire. In Alberta, they use this for regeneration. So when you've cut down the, fo the forest in Alberta, the company's responsible for replanting. But to go and get people to check that is very time consuming. And if I have to go by helicopter, it's actually very dangerous. So the idea of putting drones up to go and assess the regeneration success is something they're very keen to do. The idea would be that the forester would drive down the road, pull the drone out of their pocket, launch the drone in the air, eat some lunch, drone comes back, they go back to the office, put the hard disk into the computer, goes to the cloud, makes the point cloud, comes back next day and says, this is what you see. So these are regenerated stands, and you can easily see, digital. this is all digital, so I can just count the trees, these are the red spray paint, we've measured on the ground. Uh, so you can just see the trees, you would count them, you can try to work out the species mix, and then work out whether you think those stands are regenerating at the rate they should be. We can sort of classify that into how much dirt, how much tree, give a proportion of how much we think that's recovering properly and also do dimensions like how high it is, how tall it is, how many trees there are and so on. So we're sort of seeing these technologies go from just a cool toy to becoming this sort of operational data set that you can go away and use and look at these types of questions. From a fire point of view, it's the same thing. We, this issue of drones in the air when the fire is burning is something that's very we don't do because fire people need to have their airspace themselves when the fire is burning. So I'm not, not suggesting that we use the drones when the fire is burning, but what we do is we use the drones after to go away and get a good sense of what was the behaviour of that fire, the severity, where did it start, how did it move through the landscape, are there drivers of the severity? So again, we go in after the fire is finished, we fly it and we produce point clouds like this Again, this is com completely computer generated. So this is um, a three-dimensional model then. Every single tree, you can start to see the scorching and the burning. And then every single one of these trees, we can then get these characteristics. And Laurie and I have been supervising a student who's just finished, who's been going away and mapping severity. So he maps across the landscape, which one meter by one meter pixels were impacted by the fire or not, which ones have residual timber, which ones have no timber left, which ones are unburnt. So that type of land cover classification, which is what that is. But ultimately we can go down to the crown. And a lot of the fire models that we have to try to predict how the fire moves through the landscape rely on these models of tree attributes. How deep is the canopy? Does the canopy get down to the ground? How dense is the canopy? So that's a diagram from a paper telling us what information we need to run the model about the fire. You can see, that using a remote sensing data set, we're getting close to getting that piece of information that they need to go away and put into that model. That's tough. The world is variable. It's not quite as clean as that image, but we're able to go away and pull out those types of variables like this. 
So this is six different crowns after the five telling us this level of scorch that each individual crown had as a result of the fire. So that then becomes useful information in terms of understanding how that fire moves through the landscape and also what's left. So this idea of being able to launch your own drone and fly your own data and get this type of information that is you know, scientific quality is, is where we're starting to see this area go. The argument in remote sensing is that we are in the de democratization of imagery. Imagery is free and open. Computer resources are massively expanding, allowing us to go away and do this processing relatively cheaply. And if you don't want to use satellite data, you can also just go and fly your own. And this idea that anyone can go and put a drone in the sky, get a license and collect data is really making people think about how they collect imagery. You're not necessarily forced to buy a scene from a government agency or $10,000 from a private company. You can sort of go and collect your own imagery. And this is what we're seeing, I think, drive a lot of the questions we now have around the use of these types of technologies in climate change. So with that, I will pass to Laurie and hear more about the use of these types of things for fire. I'll answer questions. We're answering questions at the end, aren't we? Yeah, yeah perfect. So I'll answer questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. We're now going to hear from Laurie Daniels, professor from the Faculty of Forestry, UBC, Forest and Conservation Sciences. Her research strives to advance fundamental scientific knowledge on forest dynamics, which is imperative for conserving and managing contemporary forests and adapting to global environmental change. Her research characterizes how natural disturbances, humans and climate interact to drive temperate forest dynamics and resilience. It has produced three key contributions. One, international collaborations demonstrate widespread tree mortality in North and South America, disentangling the relative impacts of drought, insects and pathogens. Secondly, Many forests in the Canadian Cordillera are increasingly susceptible to wildfire due to complex interactions among fire suppression, land use, and climate change. And thirdly, her novel forest reconstructions include tree ring methods adapted to address Aboriginal cultural uses and traditional management largely overlooked by forest managers. She has partnerships with local to national governments, environmental organizations, forest management companies, community forests, and First Nations, which have helped her translate these scientific advances to operational conservation, restoration, and management policies and practices. Laurie is going to speak to us on the title, Wildfires in British Columbia, Causes, Consequences, and Coexistence. Thank you, Laurie. Fantastic. The online audience can now see and hear us as well. Well, thank you for that introduction, Olive, and thank you, Nicholas, for that overview, kind of the 10,000 foot, I'm going to dive us right down and bring us 
back to some of our experiences um, and try to, to relate to some of what my research group has been doing, but some of what we've all been experiencing, I think in British Columbia over recent years, the impacts of wildfires, the smoke that we've been breathing, um, the stories that we hear about in the news, and of course the, the impacts on our, our citizens and communities across our province um, and across Western Canada and other parts of the world as well. I wanna start with a video. I want you to watch for a few moments and think what this fire inspires in you. What does it make you think of? It's a lightning ignited fire that burned just outside the community of Nelson in the summer of 2015. And it, like many fires, burned in what we call the wildland urban interface, burning within an area which impacts communities. Here, the fire burning viewed from, from downtown and photographed by Agne, or Adrian Wagner, an artist um, in Nelson, who took this time lapse photography. And I think it really captures in my mind um, a fire burning so close to town is a place where we have evacuations, homes are at risk. It triggers for many people kind of a fear response. And we've certainly seen such tremendous impacts of fire in three out of the last six summers in British Columbia. At the same time, I want to remind you that fire is an important ecological process. And so when I look at a scene like this as an ecologist, I also see a natural process, which is critical for biodiversity, for ecosystem function, and in fact, for the long-term resilience of our ecosystems and our communities in British Columbia. So here's the conundrum with wildfire. It's on one hand, a disaster that can have tremendous negative consequences for our communities when those fires burn in the wrong place at the wrong time. And on the other hand, it's an essential process. And without that process, we actually find ourselves in a more challenging and difficult position. So let me tell you a little bit more about that. And I'm gonna take us back to June 30th, 2021. And so here what we're seeing is uh, from the weather network, this was what was filling our television screens. This is the Sparks Lake fire burning just outside of Kamloops. On this particular morning, the Skechison First Nation was evacuating from their home. We see in our dry forests of British Columbia, our warm, dry ecosystems where forests integrate with grasslands and shrublands ground fires that are burning at high intensity with tremendous ecological impacts. We know that that fire, those fires um, and the ones like them that burned in 2021 were a result of this tremendous weather event. So the heat dome of 2021, we see here the, the map showing the air departure, the air temperature anomalies, over 20 degrees Celsius warmer in 2021 than it had been in the previous six or seven years. When we look at the, the heat map um, with the, the temperature records being broken, of course, the most famous being that, that fire, um, the temperature record being broken in Lytton at 90 or 46.9 or it's 49.6 degrees Celsius, which I find absolutely astounding when you realize that the temperature record set in Lytton that year or on that day actually exceeds the record for Las Vegas, Nevada. Of course, when we scaled up and look at the province from a fire perspective, here's the fire weather map for that particular day and it's showing us the danger, the fire danger conditions um, during, during um, different days. In this particular case on the far left, the June um, 2021. And so here you can see almost the entire province was at high to extreme fire danger. We had replicated that in 2018 and 2017 when over a million hectares burned. And of course, firestorm, August 2003, you might remember that's the year that fire burned into and affected the community of Kelowna. What I want to point out here is that one, the changes that we're seeing through time, look at the area burned. 2003 was just over a quarter million hectares and we considered that an excessive fire year with tremendous costs. These days, we look back and long for a year when only a quarter million hectares burned. I'd also like to point out that in the first, or the, the three graphs on the, the right are showing extreme conditions in August. And yet in 2021, a hallmark of climate change, we had high to extreme fire danger across the entire province at the end of June. 
earlier starts to fire seasons, later ends to fire seasons as we experienced here in September and October here on the coast this year, um, are contributing to the types of fires that we're experiencing across our landscape. The fire in Lytton was probably the most devastating fire that we've had in our province, burning 90% of the homes and businesses um, in the midst of this heat dome with tremendous human consequence and really an eye-opener to us. And for me, I was actually in Williams Lake with my research team. We were taking a day off because it was too hot to be working in the forest, something I wouldn't have imagined I would be telling people about my field work in the caribou. Um, and yet we were taking a day, kind of getting reorganized, making some plans for subsequent weeks, and my phone started buzzing. And it was UBC News, and they were telling me, Lori, it happened like you said it would. We had been concerned about the kinds of changes and types of impacts wildfires have been having in communities in British Columbia and drawing analogies to California, where we've seen such catastrophic human effects of wildfires. And so here in Lytton, um, the Lytton Creek fire ignited on the 30th of June kind of was, was one more step towards those catastrophic impacts in our own communities. Linking this to the climate change patterns we're seeing, the, the high pressure system that established and persisted through the summer of 2021 um, with multiple waves of heat impacting us relate to this omega block, this change in the jet stream that's been associated perhaps with changes in the temperature gradient between the high Arctic and the tropics as that temperature gradient weakens, we end up with the jet stream instead of flowing as it normally would kind of west to east, it actually forms these large loops and it or results in these persistent blocking highs. And when those blocking highs break down, they come with them and they generate with them a lot of lightning. And so we actually get lightning outbreaks. Under hot, dry conditions, you get lightning, but no rain. It's the perfect conditions for ignitions of multiple fires. And so we saw that in the summer of, of 2021, where we had multiple days in the first half of July, where 40 plus fires were being ignited and burning on consecutive days throughout the province. And we saw that also not just in British Columbia, but over large landscapes. So we saw similar patterns as these, this weather system expanded um, further to the east and created lightning outbreaks in Saskatchewan and Manitoba and Northwest Ontario. They too experienced peak fire seasons um, coinciding with our fire season of 2021. And these are the types of responses or types of changes that we're seeing in climate leading to extreme temperatures, prolonged droughts, Lightning occurrence increasing, a 12% increase in lightning for every one degree of Celsius that we see warming is the, the um, relationship that's developing when we look at a global scale. So tremendous implications for our very broadly forested landscape as Nicholas has just shared with us. So coming back into British Columbia then, the fires of 2021 really focused in and around the Southern Caribou and the Thompson Okanagan around the Kamloops community. And so this is a kind of a screenshot grab from BC Wildfire Service, their maps. We were monitoring these maps on a daily basis. I had students working between 100 Mile and Kelowna. Um, they were dodging those fires. We were moving field crews out of the forest into new locations so that they weren't in places that were under evacuation alert. And certainly we weren't there when they became a lot evacuation orders. Many of the fires that burned in, in 2021, um, the, the largest fires here are between 70 and 95,000 hectares each. So we had almost 600,000 hectares of forest burn in this region. And that's on top of the hundreds of thousands of hectares that burned in 2017 and 2018 as well. So the size of these fires and also the intensity of the fires, the rate at which they spread are really crossing over a threshold. We've had a real switch um, in the way that fires are behaving, even in these dry forests um, that we don't think sustained these types of crown fires in the past. Let me take you into one of our study areas just outside the community of Logan Lake. Here we are in October. This is the Thanksgiving weekend in 2021. My research team and I out collecting post-fire data on a research plot. We established that plot, this little X on the ground, the stake. We established that plot, we went back and relocated our plot center and remeasured the trees. 
Um, the plot we'd established in June obviously burned at high severity as part of the fire that burned right up to the edge of the community of Logan Lake, but was stopped. And I'll talk about that in a few more moments. Things you might notice about this picture, not one of those trees survived. All were killed, scorched, their needles and leaves consumed. There's no organic material left on the ground. All of the leaf litter or organics were right down to bare mineral soil. It's like walking in a, in a sandbox. And this divot here, well, when we'd been there in June, it was a stump of an old Douglas fir tree that was about waist high. And what you're seeing is where its roots reach out underground. And yet those roots were 100% consumed, leaving these hollows beneath the ground. And the mineral soil scorched and discolored because of the heat of the fire. Now, when we put this in this bigger context, remember multiple fires were like that or burning at that intensity and having impacts around this region. And here we're looking at the July mountain fire um, that burned across the Coquihalla in, in August of 2021, that also burned much of the headwaters of the cold water stream, cold water river system that flows down into the community of Merritt. And so I want you to remember going back exactly a year ago this week, these landscapes with these exposed soils, these hydrophobic soils that now have had their physical attributes and their chemistry change so that when water hits those soil surfaces, instead of penetrating down into the soil to be taken up by the roots of the plants that no longer exist on the sites, those soils are hydrophobic. They shed the water and instead of absorbing into the ground, it becomes runoff and it becomes runoff into our streams and our mountain systems down into the network of streams and rivers, ultimately entering into communities, down into the Fraser Valley and out into the ocean. And so next came our November consecutive atmospheric rivers. So we're getting kind of the introduction to climate and vegetation here from the class of geography class where we begin to stack on these, um, these natural processes and so here's the animation that, out, or that NASA produced, and I will provide it one more. I'm going to go back and run that one more time. Sorry, there we go. There. So you can see those atmospheric rivers building um, and um, coming in, bringing that tremendous series of weather systems into coastal British Columbia with, with the lower mainland, um, the Fraser Valley, and then our coastal region. Um, with the incursions crossing right over the coast, um, the coast mountains and into the interior. When we look at the maps that described how much rain we got over that short period of time, of course, it was a couple of hundred to 300 millimeters um, up in the area around Hope. And what was described to me by some of my colleagues that was really remarkable was not just the amount of rain we, we received on the coast, but that it crossed over the coastal range into that region around the Coquihalla summit and onto the east slope. We also had under, under these circumstances rain coming down onto snow. It was warm conditions that came in with that atmospheric river. So the snow that had started to accumulate melted and then had rain on top of it, all contributing ultimately to the catastrophic flooding that we know had such tremendous impacts. And so I bring these together to talk about the disturbance cascades that we're experiencing. You know, starting with the heat dome, moving to the fire, the changes to the ecosystem, its ability to absorb precipitation. These weren't the most extreme atmospheric rivers, but when we begin to pull together the details about them, the nuances of the events onto these burned landscapes, the impacts of flooding, we're looking at Sumas Prairie on the left and Merritt just downstream from that July mountain fire um, up that had burned in much of the headwaters. And of course that had consequences for landslides and critical infrastructure that cut us off from the rest of Canada um, in terms of roads and, and railways for many weeks. I do want to comment here about some of the costs because the costs that we are paying as a society in reaction to these, these um, catastrophic events is huge. We spent almost $800 million in 2021 alone trying to suppress fires. Our fire suppression bills, if we add them up from 2017 to 2021, 
was over $4 billion. And quite frankly, we haven't been very successful. <laughs> Those are our three record fire seasons, three, you know, over 3.3 million hectares burned and it cost us $4 billion. Insured losses um, here underrepresent the total losses because as we're learning, as these disturbances and disasters impact more and more segments of our society, not everyone has sufficient insurance or any insurance. And in some cases they have insurance, but it doesn't cover the impacts that they're suffering through these natural disasters. The indirect costs for fire typically are somewhere between three and eight times what the direct costs are. In this one, um, they could be as high as 30 times the direct costs of the attempts to suppress the fires. Estimates for British Columbia from last year were $8 billion. Similarly, when we look at the flooding effects, we're looking at another $9 billion to actually respond to the floods and then to mitigate so that we don't have the future impacts. So last year was a $17 billion year when we put these together. So how did we end up in this tremendous situation when we think about wildfire? Some of this becomes a history lesson. We have to step back a little bit and think about our understanding of fire and our perspectives. So our policy in British Columbia, going back a century, has been to detect and suppress fires. Our society has viewed fire as a negative thing, a consequence. It can burn homes, it burns communities, it has tremendous costs in the forest, which are an economic source, a driver of our economy in British Columbia. So our policy, for a century has been to detect and suppress fires. And we actually saw that that ability through the technology that came after the Second World War, the technology that we put towards detection and suppression gave us increased capabilities and we became better and better at it. In fact, by the 1970s, we had gone past just protecting our homes and our communities to the forests in general. The policy was to protect those forests for economic gain and we got really good at it. Our BC Wildfire Service statistics are over 94% of fires were suppressed before they reached four hectares in size. From about 1970 to the present, so we have a 50 year period where we've put out almost all fires, which means also in almost my whole lifetime and certainly my entire career, the fires that I have been witnessing and experiencing and studying are only the 6%, the most extreme fires that exceeded our technological ability to suppress them. So we have a real observational experiential bias towards the most extreme fires. And because we've been so successful at putting out so many fires, we also have a societal expectation that if there is a fire, we should be able to put it out, except in the rare condition um, where it's extreme weather or an extreme extreme fire condition. So a lot of the work that we do in my lab and, and um, the work that we have done in terms of the historical context for this, this type of um, understanding of, of forest fires and how our fires or forest function is based on tree rings. And so what you're looking here is a partial cookie from a ponderosa pine tree. And you'd expect in a tree, you know, to there be a center or a pith of the tree and the rings to form concentric circles. You can count those rings, of course, to figure out the age of the tree. Here you can see that the, the rings are not forming concentric circles, but rather swirls that are interrupted every few years. And what you're looking at is each of these black lines. One here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 11 times this tree survived a surface fire that burned around its base and damaged the tree rings, but did not kill the tree. This tree is actually the record for North America for ponderosa pine. It has 52 fire scars in it. The tree survived 52 fires between the late 1300s and the late 1800s. It's based, um, it was growing, it was a, a ponderosa pine tree that grew adjacent to the tobacco plains on the Tanaha traditional territory of Southeast British Columbia. Those fire scars in the tree rings, not only on the tobacco plains, but throughout our dry forests of BC, they deeply in number starting in the early 1900s and by the 1940s, very few fire scars have formed on trees in our forests since then. 
And so fire suppression, our ability to detect and suppress fires, has effectively eliminated the surface fires from these dry forest ecosystems. These surface fires were the ones that would burn through the understory under cooler and wetter conditions. They're low intensity burns that would consume fuels, consume seedlings and saplings, but leave the large trees with the thick bark that were adapted to fire intact, leaving us open forest structures that were resilient to these low intensity fires. This is a chart that comes from one of our fire scar reconstructions where each of the horizontal lines represents a plot. And it's a series of 30, 30 plus plots that we established in the Alex Fraser Research Forest just outside the community of Williams Lake. At each of the plots, every time, every time you see a triangle, that indicates when a fire burned and scarred a tree that the tree survived to record that fire in its rings. And so there's a few key messages that I'd like to, to highlight here. One, let me back up here, one, is that there was a lot of surface fire in this landscape historically. So between the 1600s and the early 1900s, there was fire burning somewhere in the study area about once every 15 years. Sometimes the intervals were only a few years, the longest intervals were a few decades, but there were fires continuously burning in the area. Starting in the late, 1900, or late 1900s and then accumulating across the landscape through the 20th century, we have an absence of fire. No longer those fire scars or those surface fires burning and scarring trees. And so the red bars are showing us now the fire-free period, the interval when fire, um, in absence of fire, where we've had ultimately an accumulation of needles and fine branches on the ground, trees growing into the forest where it becomes denser and thicker with more fuel. The pictures that Nicholas was showing us taken by the drones would show high density with a lot of biomass up in the crowns of these forests. As we accumulate that biomass, we also are accumulating fuels that can burn. And so when these forests ultimately um, are subjected to fire today, they don't burn at low intensity and low severity, but they burn rather as crown fires with the fire spreading up into the canopies and spreading treetop to treetop. So what caused all of this change? Again, it's a kind of a reflection on many aspects of our understanding of fire and ecosystems, but also a cultural and historical account that takes us back to understanding indigenous fire stewardship. In many of these areas where we have worked, um, we've also collaborated with indigenous leaders and knowledge holders who share with us information about cultural use of fire, the use of surface fire to cultivate medicinal, um, medicinal plants and food plants in many areas, to clear landscapes, um, to tend the areas around summer and winter camps, and also to create forage for game. And so fire was being actively used across many of these landscapes and starting with colonization and settlement in the late 1800s with the introduction of disease, we begin to see a change where we've depleted or removed from that indigenous cultural fire from the landscape. So that even preceded the types of changes that come with intentional detection and suppression of fires. Superimpose on that our fire suppression policies of our modern societies, we take open forests, um, begin to become occupied with more and more trees, the forests become denser, We've seen over broader landscapes, they become very homogeneous when all of the forests in absence of fires creating those mosaics that, um, that Nicholas was showing us, you end up with very uniform forests with mature trees that are all at the same time susceptible to insects and disease. And in this case, the mountain pine beetle. We can also superimpose on that our land use, harvesting, with patches of, of clear cut logging, responses to mountain pine beetle by salvage logging have contributed to changing these landscapes in ways that again, make them more flammable. And so ultimately, when we combine all of these forces, we see here a landscape that in 2017 burned at very high intensity. This is the Elephant Hill fire that burned 192,000 hectares just north of, of Kamloops, 
between Cache Creek and Clinton, and then east up into the mountains, burning about 50% of the traditional territory of the Bonaparte First Nation. And that wildfire burned, as you can see with the reds and oranges dominating the map, it burned at moderate and high intensity. And so the impacts on the vegetation were really intense, um, killing the majority of the trees, changing the organics in the soil, changing the hydrology of the system. And it makes us question, we're now monitoring to see if in fact we will have forests regenerating at these sites. And that work is ongoing both in person and using the types of remote sensing technologies that Nicholas was referring to. So what I've described to you now is kind of this era of megafires that we see not only in British Columbia, but occurring around the world, where we have in British Columbia, the result of our kind of timber and stand level focus, this focus over so much of our landscape on producing timber, protecting timber from fire in order to drive our economy, we've homogenized our landscapes and made them more susceptible to fire. Where we've looked for ways in which we can change that pattern, we end up with policy conflicts and barriers to innovation so that we've found that there's quite a bit of resistance. There's inertia in the status quo and resistance to actually mitigate or change the way that we're behaving on the landscape that would reduce those fuels and make our ecosystems um, more re resilient. We also have these vulnerable communities and naive citizens who again have have had the experience over much of their life that when there is fire, you can call for help and successfully put it out. And with that combination, then we end up with a lack of political will to really take the giant steps required in order to make the changes in fire and forest management to make our communities and forests more resilient. So let me share with you some thoughts just as a wrap up. I have a few more slides to show you ways in which we need to learn to coexist with fire. Fire is not going away. Remember, it's an essential part of these ecosystems and as climate change continues to lengthen the summers and the fire seasons to give us hotter, drier, peak summer conditions, we will continue to see more fire on our landscapes with catastrophic impacts as we experienced in Lytton in 2021. But there's also many ways in which we can begin to adapt and mitigate simultaneously um, to be better prepared. And some of these have been underway for some years. So if I start kind of at the top of that mural, we need to diversify our wildfire management, allowing some fires back onto the landscape. And we see managed wildfires or modified response. We're about 10 years into this program now. And so we do have many fires in parts of the landscape or fires that we allow to burn because they reintroduce diversity without putting lives and homes at risk. So where it's um, sustainable to do so, and where it doesn't put um, lives at risk, we will allow wildfire back on that landscape. We can also restore fire to landscapes, both through ecological processes and through cultural fire. And so there's um, new programs being developed within the BC um, Wildfire Service to support cultural ind or Indigenous cultural burning on traditional territories. So beyond just reserves, but onto territories, a program that's in development. And then we've had about 20 years now, a fairly active mechanical thinning, prescribed fire and active mitigation to try to reduce risk, particularly around communities. Diversifying our forest management becomes really important. We have had a tremendous legacy in our province of using clear cut harvesting and justifying it because it represents the high severity fires that we have seen and experienced. But remember, that's the top 6% of fires that escape suppression. Our management needs to diversify so that we're representing the frequency, the size and magnitude, not of just those 6% of fires that we're unable to, to um, suppress, but the full range that historically burned on those landscapes. And so that is going to take a, re a remarkable amount of change in the way that we think about and implement forest management. I do want to share what I think is a real success story. Work that we've been doing with the community forests where they have been treating the forests surrounding their community to create defensible space, to try to reduce fuel loads and reduce the chance of crown fire burning right into towns. So the pictures on the top are from Logan Lake and West Bank First Nation community forests in the wildland urban interface surrounding their communities. 
And as you can see, dense forests with a lot of dead material accumulating in both the crowns and on the ground. And the treatments reduce the density of trees, lift the crowns up from the ground, and also reduce the amount of burnable material um, on the surface. Where we've run models, we find that without treatment, there's a variety of fire types that could be sustained in our forests, including some areas where only surface fire would burn. But with treatment, we almost completely eliminate the chance of active crown fire and we increase the amount of surface fire, which is the goal that we're moving towards. We want to retain the trees, we want to create habitat, restore habitats, reduce the chance of crown fire, but maintain a forested ecosystem. And so our modeling is indicating that we're successful. But what happens when fire interacts with these, these forests? And so that answer also comes from Logan Lake, back to those plots that we established in June and burned in July, August, and we revisited in October. And what we found, although our sample sizes are not large, where there had been treatments and the fires interacted with them, the treatments were successful. Instead of 76%, only 20% of trees were killed. The amount of scorch and damage to their crowns, their green crowns was much lower. And the ground, the fire burned along the surface of the ground, affecting 73% of the area, but it left the forest floor and the organics intact to absorb moisture and to be able to support the trees that survived into the future. So these treatments are in fact, not only working when we test their efficacy with models, but they're effective when we, when we see fire interacting with them in the big picture. And lastly, I'm gonna challenge any of you out there who might own homes that are in fire prone environments or recreational properties or have family members who live um, or recreate in these areas. Can you find the fire risks in these pictures? Also important is the role of individual citizens to be aware, to be educated, for us to educate them about the conditions in which they burn, the fire prone environments in which we live, the risks that we have with our homes, leaving our fire, our firewood and our propane tanks right next to our homes um, in the heat of the summer or under evacuation conditions leaving burnable debris on the roof of your house and in the gutters is a pretty, pretty unfortunate way to leave your home during fire season if you live in a fire prone environment. So if I come back to this cartoon, going from kind of our fire dumb to our fire smart landscape, then how do we learn to coexist with fire? We know that we need to diversify our wildfire and our forest management. We have made small inroads in this direction, but we need to do much more. That can be guided by our Western science with experiments and monitoring, but we're also incorporating more and more Indigenous knowledge very successfully as we move forward, especially with programs like the Ecocultural Prescribed Burning. Our work needs to be evidence-based and adaptive, and it has to work across scales. We focus very much in BC when we manage our forests on one patch to the next. But looking at the landscape scale and thinking about the communities in the context of those landscapes becomes really critical. Proactive management is going to be key in order to safeguard our communities and create defensible spaces. And that's going to need support from both citizens um, who hopefully we can engage and educate through the Spire Smart programs and through community protection programs. So my final words here is that our wildfires from 2021, I really don't want them to be just another wake up call. We talk about 2003, 2017, 2018, 2021. I was asked recently during a media interview, did I think that fall of 2022 was a wake up call? And my answer, although I didn't say it to the media, I was like, are we not woke yet? <laughs> We've been facing these crises for 18 years now when it comes to fire and they've accelerated in recent years for our forests and communities to become resilient to climate change, transformative change is urgently needed. And it will take work across our whole of society approach to learn to coexist with fire. And finally, I'd like to just acknowledge the tremendous work by the graduate students, postdocs and research assistants in our lab who have done a huge amount of the, the background work um, to provide the knowledge that I've shared today. And then also to say thank you to our collaborators and the agencies that fund our research. 
including the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies, who have funded much of our work with the communities um, and Community Forest Association of BC. So thank you. Can I be heard? Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, Nicholas. We're now going to open up uh, for questions. If you could join us, Nicholas. And uh, I'm sure there must be questions right here, Ralph. Just a question to the other side, as I hear your focus. Your, your focus is, is on the, the, bio, the biophysical world in which you have to educate the communities, the residents. Is any work being done looking at how effective that is that that appears to be your solution for the future is to change to change the understanding of communities leaders and residents it, who's who's doing that and how does how how effective is that that's a great question so there's a whole social ecological component to the work that we do and so much of our work is collaborative um, we have social ecological scientists and experts uh, we've worked a lot with the community forests and with First Nations communities through their agencies like the First Nations Emergency Services Society um, and the BC Community Forest Association who are doing much of this work and who also kind of team, kind of partner, I guess, to, to work through the programs. We collaborate also with agencies like FireSmart Canada and FireSmart BC who are kind of taking the science and the knowledge that we're kind of generating and building that in um, with, with the education programs that they're developing. And there is work um, you know, within the social sciences that are particularly focused on kind of uptake. What are the barriers? Why are communities not moving more quickly on this? We've seen fairly slow uptake, although we now know that it's very effective to do the fuels mitigation at the community level. Um, we've done a lot of work in the last five years. In fact, our, our funding from Peter Wall Institute supported work um, by a couple of graduate students and in collaboration with Shannon Hagerman, um, Dr. Shannon Hagerman in, in forestry to understand those community perspectives, the barriers, the policies that are preventing further action. Um, and then that's really led to a collaboration now with BC Wildfire Service, where we work with them to try to update some of those policies and, and implement new kind of standards of practice. So we are working, who knew that I'd go from being a tree winger nerd to such a diverse range of topics through these really fruitful collaborations with other experts and crossing between the physical sciences and the social sciences and working on that education component as well. I don't know if that is a satisfying response. It's challenging work for sure. And I would say all of, a whole of society approach. I don't want to put it all on the homeowners and the municipalities. I think that's a mistake when we do that. Um, I think there are changes that need to happen at the provincial government level as well. Um, and that's proving to be more challenging to see. There's a lot of inertia in those provincial policies around forest management um, and, and some of the changes that probably need to be implemented to improve resilience of our ecosystems um, is, is slower in coming than I would have liked to have seen. Thank you. Laurie, you mentioned Logan Lake as, as being something interesting. And it's my understanding that that's the town itself, the citizens have been quite involved in protecting their community against fire. Could you explain how that happened and how, particularly how the, the society there uh, was involved? Yeah, it's such a great example. Logan Lake was the first FireSmart certified can or, um, community in Canada. Um, and again, it was partly their community forest association. So they have an area-based tenure where the forest immediately surrounding the community is being managed um, by an, an association which is based within the community. So that the forests are managed to generate or managed, I guess, based on the objectives defined by the community and also generates revenue that comes back to the community. Their community forest manager is um, a person who was well aware of the risks and hazards in a warm, dry environment, in the types of forests that surround them, in the condition of the forest, especially after the mountain pine beetle epidemic had such tremendous impacts there. They started in the early 2000s 
to look at the condition of the forest to educate the community about the risk of wildfire around them and to begin this process of mitigating the fuels and actually doing harvesting treatments, thinning out the forest and reducing some of those fuels. And there's been some resistance as there is in many places, um, for, you know, the concerned citizens about harvesting trees and impacts on the forest and wildlife. Um, and yet I would say their community champion, the team that's managing their, their forest has been really important. The education program is a fairly small community. They had seen some fires affecting communities around them and chose to go down that path of um, taking on the fire smart principles at the homeowner and community level and they're really um, they're really a tremendously strong example again to their managers were savvy and were able to apply for and receive the funding from provincial agencies in order to move forward with the type of mitigation work that they needed to do those are barriers to a lot of small communities. They just don't have either the expertise or the funds to be able to move forward with developing community wildfire resilience plans, prescriptions, applying for money, implementing them. Logan Lake kind of came together and uh, had that community champion to make that happen. Thank you, that's an amazing success story. It is, it is. Frank? Yeah. Sorry, let's stay following with the uh, community Frank. forest professional. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> um, my question is, what kind of challenges to forest management does natural regeneration of a logged forest present? Um, I have a farm in a woodlot on Denman Island, which was basically clear cut in the early 1900s, well, between you know 1900 and just after the First World War. And I notice we have, I have, I have trees that are 100 to 150 years old. But the other thing I have is, is growing among them, of course, uh, a lot of smaller uh, saplings, smaller trees that are, you know, balsam fir and Douglas fir that are trying to get up there so that they can get some light. So the result is extremely dense. And I look at this and I say, hmm, this is a hazard. This stuff needs to be you know, taken down and cleared out. So it seems to me, I don't know, my question is how do we get back to any kind of natural condition where we, we don't really need to intervene given what we have done historically to logging forests in British Columbia? And as I say, Denman Island, you know, if I look at the historical pictures of it all the way back to the 1890s and up to the 1920s, absolutely clear cut. <laughs> yeah, and actually, if we look at much of the um, the Gulf Islands and even parts of the eastern side of Vancouver Island, if we look at the historical maps, and Graham, you might know a little bit about these, the historical maps that first were the township and range um, assessments that were done, and they used, you know, witness trees, and they, you know, mapped out what the vegetation was. If you look at those maps, they talk about the pine, or they talk about the prairies, the 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 woodlands um, and the, the oak and the pine woodlands. And then there's little patches of forest. And when you look back, those are often the areas, it's the Gary Oak areas and the meadows that were probably killed or cleared by the Coast Salish people using fire, um, cultivating plants like camas in those regions. So fire was even on the east side of Vancouver Island and many of our Gulf Islands was sustained through the use of cultural fire in the past. And so, um, thank you, I just got the hint to hold the microphone a little higher. Um, so, so there we go, again, a culturally managed landscape that kind of led to these much more open conditions. Clearly, we live in a very productive environment, moderate climate, lots of moisture on the coast. Even our interior forests are highly productive and can grow back trees under the right conditions and when we give them those opportunities. Um, with the exception, I would say, of these very hot, dry conditions, there are concerns about being able to regenerate forests in these big burn scars. And even in some of our warmer, drier environments and the types of droughts we're experiencing today um, in recent years, it's not clear that our forests are successfully regenerating over broad areas of the landscape. But coming back to your question, I, I think um, it kind of comes back to what are our desirable conditions on these landscapes and we do need to actively manage them. And so I think this becomes a real problem when we, we think about trying to, when we've tried to conserve and preserve some of the values on our landscapes, we 
we need to think about what was it that we were trying to conserve and preserve and how do we make sure that we can still have those elements without putting them, you know, in the short term, without putting them at risk in the long term. Um, and so the answer to that question varies in different parts of the landscape, but I would be concerned on, on a place like Denman if you have a very dense understory of Douglas fir coming in. Um, a lot of those understory trees are, you know, they're doing what Douglas fir trees do. They grow in the shade in those dry, you know, east side of Vancouver Island environments. And it's a very productive environment, but it does create a fire risk even on a place like Denman. Um, and we certainly have seen that since summers like 2015 when the Elaho Valley and Boulder Creek burned, generating smoke here. The fires we've had on the island in 2017, 2018, even the fires that we experienced in the lower mainland in 2022. You know, fire is becoming more common in with the more severe droughts here on the coast as well. So I think uh, the coastal forest, we've kind of thought of ourselves as immune to fire. I think that that is rapidly changing. Thank you, Graham. I'm going to change horses here and ask Nicholas a question. Uh, because uh, I was completely overwhelmed by the, the richness and the sheer magnitude of the data that you now have. And it's, it's stunning that you're able to generate these very close time series. Uh, but let me try and clarify my own ignorance here. Uh, because back when I was thinking about very early remote sensing, ground truthing was a, you know, a real big thing and people had to get out there with boots and check the images and the results. And has, has the drone replaced the need for ground truthing of that older sort? And when we have, that's the second part of the question, when we have this incredibly detailed data from satellites and from drones. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the applications of that for forest management and forestry? Great. Thank you for the questions. So um, ground truthing, how accurate are we in terms of what we see? Yeah, I tell my students it's still fundamentally important, and it is. And at the plot scale, where you might have a drone perhaps or a small image, maybe a fire, then, then field work is critical and we can go and do it. It is challenging to think about how do you verify that map of Canada? You, know, you cannot go and put plots all through Canada. So then you rely on other remote sensing to then verify that remote sensing. So we would have other satellites that are finer detail that we would have more confidence in in terms of what we're exactly seeing. And then we would use that as the truth to verify this. Believe it or not, we use Google Earth a lot. So Google Earth is, Google owns Google Earth, but all the data in Google Earth is from a whole variety of satellites that Google has sort of purchased. So it's like a, a mosaic or a, an archive of what Google's managed to buy. Um, so we sort of put random points, random point generators that then go into Google Earth to take us to random places. We have trained observers and then they look at what they see on Google Earth and then verify that. But there's been a lot of criticism about these global products. How are they verified? Um, there's a push to use more citizen science. So as you sort of have global maps, get people to, um, you know, go into this, the citizens themselves to go in and use apps and verify what it is as a way of trying to, to verify the accuracy because the, the planet is changing, but it's not changing. This is a statistic sort of part, you know, we don't, we're not changing 10% per year. The, ch the earth is changing a little bit per year. So if you're trying to make a map, every year you need to be really right every year to get the change right and so the change is like one percent or two percent and yet these maps are probably 80 percent accurate so 20 percent error so this is becoming a big a lot of debate about this and how you verify that um yeah i think the um the drones and and their use in forestry the um there's a, there's a few ways. One, I think they're extraordinary for capturing the information at the plot at the time. So I think all, you know, I think Laurie, who, who is a big, use, big user of drones, but I think every ecologist in five years' time will fly their plot with a drone. We now have drones that fly inside the canopy. So there's like drone Olympics where kids fly the drones all around, but the technology is good enough now that you can fly inside the canopy without the drone hitting the trees. So you can actually fly around the plot 
capture of an information, it becomes a digital record of that plot. And it's so accurate that you can put it on a screen and physically measure, oh, I forgot to measure that tree. I can now measure it virtually in the computer. So this idea of capturing digitally as a tree representation and then using that as your record. So I believe in time we will have tree rings and then we'll have a three-dimensional point cloud that will be the permanent capture of that plot. And that will be a long-term data record as much as you know, a DBH is. So I think that's from a scientific point of view. Forest managers, um, you know, we're seeing harvesting companies use drones every day now. So at the end of the night, they'll fly what they did during the day and then they'll report it back to their manager. It's proof of what the operators have done. It's proof they didn't go down to the riparian too far. It's proof they didn't do this. So it's a, it's a record of what they did. And ultimately we see it as being something where you could go and verify um, you know, was the amount of timber taken that was supposed to be taken and those sorts of things. So it's a bit of an auditing tool. It's a bit of a, a check to see how you went in the past day. So we're, we are seeing it used in that way. Not quite, I would say, completely operationally. We've still got some pretty recalcitrant foresters out there. And, and it's difficult. You know, it's difficult to download that data from Cache Creek onto the internet, into the cloud, process the thing, get it back. So there's sort of internet and all these sorts of issues. But that's what we're starting to move towards. And I think we're going to have drones used by foresters as much as they use a DBH tape. I mean, I think it, it's extraordinary what we're, what we're capturing from these things. Sandra, is there a question from the audience? Yes. audience? Yes, thank you. I got a question for Dr. Koop from Paul Harrison. Are the remote sensing techniques you described being used in collaboration with those indigenous peoples who live in some of the more remote areas and have traditional knowledge about how their landscapes have changed and are changing? So that's a really good question. Uh, it is not an area of specialty for me, um, so I don't have many links with Indigenous communities, you know, in terms of the, um, yeah, their Indigenous knowledge and the patterns we see, but, but there's no doubt that these types of layers are being used in that way. So we are seeing these communities use these types of products much more than we have in the past to sort of explain the patterns we see and also work with these communities around the, the technologies that we use. There's a lot of training involved to try to get these, these communities to use these types of technologies. So there's, um, there's work that we do in that aspect of it, but I'm not a, I don't work specifically with indigenous communities around the patterns that we see, but I think there's really interesting questions there to ask. Yeah. So there is a really great example, um, even just from the last six weeks, where the Silkatine First Nation and the Hanikatine um, up on the Chilcotin Plateau have been um, implementing prescribed burns on their traditional territory and did, did burns this, this fall, um, where they flew drones before and after to map the distribution of the fire. They combined that with field plots, so they've had um, crews out crews from UBC working with the community, training members of the community, collecting the data and archiving it in the community, um, but using drones to actually see what were the impacts of the fire, where did the fire spread to, um, and then be able to measure and document uh, the changes and then keep track. Um, the, the areas that are being burned are being burned for many cultural objectives. And so using drones combined with that field work, um, so using the strengths of both of them are their way to to monitor and to ensure that they're achieving their, their cultural objectives. Perfect, thank you. Yes. Uh, I have another question. How can ordinary citizens influence the provincial government to address this problem in a timely manner? Such a great question. <laughs> yeah. You know, we've talked about this a lot. I've, I've talked a lot with the communities that I work with in the interior of BC. So I'm going to turn that question back to the audience for a moment. And I want you to tell me here in British Columbia and here in Vancouver, what's the biggest natural disaster that might impact us here in Vancouver? What's the biggest natural disaster? Oh, Graham's got it. Yeah. What is it? Earthquake. Earthquake. So um, our provincial government has spent $17 billion on seismic upgrades in the coastal region of British Columbia because the big one might happen during our lifetime. 
So since 2004, between 2004 and 2015, it was their own report that identified $17 billion. Now that was provincial funds, municipal funds leveraged against some federal funds, but we invested $17 billion. And I'm very grateful for that. I wanted to know that my kid's school had been seismically upgraded, that our, our hospitals and critical infrastructure, that I'm not going to be on the Lionsgate Bridge when it goes down, or that it will stand in the case of, a, of an earthquake. So there's a natural disaster that may happen in our lifetime. So it's low probability, but high, high consequence. And so we identified it as a natural disaster and one to which we needed to respond and needed, needed to invest a huge amount of both funding and expertise um, and, and investment in our society. And I'm a little baffled because at the same time, we have spent $500 million between 2004 and the present on fuels mitigation in the interior of British Columbia. We've spent $4 billion just in the last five years trying to put up forest fires and we're losing homes and communities and ecosystems at an unprecedented rate now. So I'm not sure how we cross that threshold to also put other natural disasters like fire and as we experienced last year flood onto the radar where that has to be a high priority for the proactive measures. Again, last year alone cost us $17 billion in direct and indirect costs um, to the province of British Columbia and to our citizens and our society. So this is, this is a baffling question for me and I'm sure there's psychologists, social scientists, <laughs> others in the room who could help us cross that threshold, but, um, but it's a very challenging question um, and, and one that uh, I'd love to hear your comments from the audience. Well, I think it's obvious. I mean, we don't have a vested interest and in experience, i.e. in terms of economic and other interests in relationship to earthquakes that have been operating for the past, you know, 150 years. When it comes to forestry, however, we have a whole culture that's built up around forests, how they're used, how they're supposed to be managed, which you've very nicely talked to. And so culturally we have in place a whole lot of, if you like barriers or impediments to uh, bringing about change and dealing with something. None of that exists with respect to the possibility of an earthquake. And so it's culturally and socially, it's a completely different realm, which uh, I think makes it very clear why it's easy to spend a whole lot of money dealing with the possibility and the implications and outcome of a serious quake versus you know, trying to do anything uh, what you would like to see by way of what you would like to see with, with forests. But I think it's just the way it is. So, so to kind of continue on that vein, can I ask you to comment about flooding? Because flooding is also, we find it, you know, as of last year, I was quite struck by the parallels between fuels mitigation for fire protection and the critical infrastructure for flooding that really kind of came under, you know, changes in the way that provincial policy um, and then we kind of downloaded to municipalities in the early 2000s. There was kind of government policy that said no longer provincial jurisdiction. It's now up to municipalities to take care of critical infra infrastructure for flooding. Um, we did the same with fire and that came back and, and haunted us last year, and, and we still kind of suffer this consequence. But the, the $9 billion um, in British Columbia that's estimated to kind of rebuild critical flooding infrastructure, much of that is for very small communities. You know, the places like Princeton and Merritt that are seven, you know, 5,000 and 7,000 citizens where they just don't have the tax base to be able to generate the funds. So it comes back to, are we going to scale that up and deal with it at the provincial level? For flood, I would have thought, again, you know, I can see what the forest, we're counting on the forest industry and quite frankly, um, you know, we would wait in 18 years for the forest industry to step up and be a part of the, the solution. And I'm still waiting for them to have a transformative change, let alone the types of transformative change that are necessary. So that's my presentation next Thursday to the, to the Canadian Institute of Forestry is, you know, okay, we've been waiting 18 years. You know, so what are we going to do about the forest? But in the meantime, we still have this. I, I, I'm fascinated by this question, um, but I'm also haunted by it because I don't I don't see a path forward that has the levels of government coming together um, and working towards these solutions. 
Mm, go for it. Well, it's the same thing with respect to flooding. I mean, you have in place economic interests that have been around for quite a while and have already gotten used to managing uh, inappropriately, I would argue, uh, you know, the possibility of floods, water, water regimes, et cetera, et cetera. Again, it's a culture. If you're, if you're having to change a culture, and we haven't succeeded. I mean, when I look at what they're doing right now to deal with the experience with the uh, the atmospheric uh, storm that hit last year. Basically, what we're doing is exactly the same thing. We're, we're, we're instead of living with water and learning how to work with the way it behaves, we are uh, busy building infrastructure uh, bigger and better, uh, supposedly better than what we had before. We're not changing our, our way of doing things. We're just doing what we've always done, but we're doing it harder, faster, higher, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, you're up against a culture in both cases that with a mentality of uh, we like what we've got, we want to do things, and we want to have the same kind of benefits that we've had historically, and, and that's how we're going to address these things. We're going to use that as a baseline for whatever we do. A huge challenge, a huge challenge as society faces, um, especially with more of this coming towards us. General is at the back, would you? Give us your name, please, before you push the question. I'm just wondering, I was raised in White Horse and Air Force Base, and had a fire break around the whole base. It was probably about a half a kilometer away. I just bulldozed all the raw material together and had a break in the middle. So I've kind of always, often wondered, slave labor, maybe, Did they have fire breaks around those cities or do fire breaks work? Yeah, so that's that, that work that we've been doing where they have been mitigating, trying to reduce the fuels. And here in BC, we tend to leave them as shaded fuel breaks. So the big trees remain, they create a shaded understory. You still have a forested environment, but you've reduced the fuels. So it creates a, a change or a break in the fuels to change the fire behavior so that you can defend the community from there. That's most of the goals, or that's kind of the goal that's being applied as opposed to clearing all of the vegetation. So the, the kind of clearing that you've described, um, there has been a little bit of that where it's been more aggressive, you know, where they've kind of cleared areas and had these big openings on the edge of town, but um, they tried that in a couple of places in the Okanagan. Um, and what did we find? We found that the population grew, the community expanded beyond the fuel break. And so we're finding that in many places, there's investment, to create a fuel break adjacent to a community. And then the next round of um, community expansion and urbanization moves into that $200,000 fuel break and we build a few more houses and now we have to start again. Places like Kelowna and West Kelowna actually have bylaws that say when there's new urban development taking place, the developer is responsible for doing fuels mitigation in the forest immediately surrounding those homes. But who will maintain that? Because we know the trees are going to grow back just like they did on Denman Island. We will eventually have to do maintenance work or as we're finding as the population grows very rapidly in areas like the Okanagan, we'll be expanding into those areas. And so this is, this is part of the, the challenge that we face. There have been really great guidelines. They came out in July of 2021 from Natural Resources Canada where experts across the country have put together guidelines on urban development and community wildfire protection. So some of the things that can happen at that regional scale it, or at that community scale um, and municipalities and First Nations communities guidance for those, those types of steps. Um, it's challenging when we begin, even within BC, we have such a diversity of environments and forest types that what works on the coast won't necessarily be optimal for the southern interior, won't be optimal for the northern interior, not appropriate for the boreal forest. So we run into the challenges also that these are ecosystems that each respond to fire differently. Um, and you know that, that's a whole nother challenge because we tend to think of it as a one size fits all problem. No. Thank you. This is not a question to you, the speaker, but it's to all of us. Because we want to use the word management. And surely this is the core of the problem. That we view ourselves as managers of the environment rather than being part of the environment, embedded in the environment, and subservient to the environment. How do we get out of that language? 
Frank mentioned, Frank touched on it very closely a minute ago. But, but, but the fact of the matter is, it's, it's how we manage and the values and sensibilities that govern management. Because indigenous peoples, that you've nicely pointed out, managed, in fact, their resources you know, before we came along. But they did it with a different mentality. And it's the mentality we have that's the, the problem, not management per se. Yes, management for the benefit of all rather than management for being in. Thanks. I don't have an answer, obviously, for Doug's question. I think it raises an important issue, but I was going to go back to broadly the government's question that Laurie raised with respect to community forests, because Logan Lake, uh, obviously, had told us this is a success story. But my recollection is that when the idea of community forests was introduced, uh, it was roundly disparaged in many areas, and that many of the early community forests uh, failed because, uh, well, for a variety of reasons, but among which were that people saw uh, the opportunity to get downloaded funds for the running of the community forest as a way to. Uh, supplement their incomes without very much interest in the forest, should we say. And so uh, the larger question really is the one that you hinted at uh, about the, the capacity of communities to implement strategies, whether those are managing for the community or managing with the, the non-human world or whatever. Uh, there's a shortfall in many, many places of both uh, financial capital to implement plans and of uh, intellectual capital to kind of figure out different ways of doing things. So I don't know whether you have any further comments on that. Yeah, our research with the communities where we actually did surveys of communities um, across municipalities and First Nations communities across British Columbia identified exactly those issues as two of the biggest barriers. So one was access to funds that would pay for fuel, you know, developing a community wildfire protection plan, developing a prescription, implementing a prescription. Um, and then also having the local expertise. So the, the lack of expertise within, especially the smallest communities, communities with a population of fewer than 5,000 people really struggle with these issues in BC, which accounts for the majority of our, our communities. You know, 150 plus municipalities, um, 200 First Nations, more than 200 First Nations communities, and then the unincorporated and regional districts around the province. You know, this is a huge number of people who are unable to access those resources and to be able to, to move forward on those issues. The Community Forest Association, I think is a really fascinating one and I'm a real fan of that organization. So I think you're right, they kind of, there was some, some building, you know, kind of stumbling at first to get going. There are now 60 community forests across the province. They just three weeks ago had their 20th anniversary and or their 20th annual meeting um, of the Community Forest Association. They account for only 6% of the total area of the province and only 3% of the harvesting land base of the province. And yet they're real success stories in order in, in the context of kind of big giving back to their communities partnerships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. Many of them are jointly managed or managed um, by First Nations communities. Um, so they're a real model. They're also, I find them kind of fascinating because I think they're the classical version of what people talk about when we talk about forest stewardship. You know, we kind of have this, I feel like I have this romanticized version of what forest management could be. It would be stewarding the land over an area and maybe akin to some of the concepts that we have with indigenous knowledge holders and the reciprocal give and take with the land that indigenous people speak to in British Columbia that our community forests are community-based, identified you know, by the communities. What values do they want to see managed for in, in those forests immediately surrounding them? They're often not timber values. They often generate some timber or some, some economic value by harvesting some trees, but that's not the primary reason for having their community forest or the management that they're implementing there. 
Um, and so it, it kind of has both these short-term and these long-term goals. And some of that is associated also with the idea that it's area-based management. It is a block of land that they are accountable for for many decades in order to sustain their communities and the values that are important to them. We don't manage the timber harvesting land base in British Columbia like that. You know, the 64 million hectares that we manage for timber production in BC is not area-based manager management. It's largely around timber volumes. And we've set up a management system where um, we can extract timber and regenerate trees and meet the legislative requirements of timber management, but there's nobody taking care of that bigger picture landscape. There's been lack of a landscape view, and then there's been lack of leadership from the provincial government to actually do that land management. They've regulated, um, they've not monitored. <laughs> there's been rules in place, but we've really, we've really lost that. And some of that is that globalization of timber production. You know, the companies are accountable to the shareholders on a quarterly basis, and we're trying to manage the land for century. Those two things I see as almost mutually exclusive. And we find ourselves in this conundrum and now we're back to the inertia. How do we change this? Because this is the way it's always been. And it's very costly at this point um, from a, a provincial government perspective to try to change that model. So there's a strong desire from many communities in British Columbia. There are many um, who have applied for or have des expressed desire to have a community for us now based upon this very strong model that has been built over the last 20 years. The provincial government said actually just a few weeks ago at their community forest meeting, there's no desire from the provincial government to expand that particular program. But there is large investment right now with the provincial government to be redirecting some of the land tenures, the forest management tenures to Indigenous communities. And so much of that transfer is where their focus is over the next five to 10 years in response to the commitment to reconciliation and to UNDRIP. And so figuring out how that is happening and making those transfers um, in terms of responsibility for management of those lands um, back to Indigenous communities is a process that um, I think we're going to see more and more in the next decade. And there's lots of interesting questions about how that's going to work and, and how, um, how, how we'll see that move forward. But um, yeah, I was a little bit disappointed to hear the provincial, provincial government representatives at the meeting say there isn't room in, in the province for more community forests right now, because I do see them showing that kind of leadership that we're needing at the community mm -hmm. level and really um, giving us good examples of what land stewardship over the long term with both short-term benefits, but long-term benefits also um, can look like. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I guess we run out of time, but uh, are there any more questions from the Zoom, uh, uh, Sandra? One question. Let's make that the last question. So it's from uh, Bill Reese. I wonder whether you consider economic and public resultant reduction in demand for forest products and hence less pressure on our forests as a possible addition to your possible solutions. But with continued growth, pressures, including that from wildfire, on our forests can only increase and all attempts at improved management will prove largely ineffective. That's a small question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question. Wow, there's a last question for you. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure I captured the the key the key nugget in the question. It was around kind of changing the forest management. Sorry to ask you to repeat part of it, but I don't want to start blathering about things that might not answer the core question. <laughs> Yeah, it's about uh, economic and population degrowth as one of the uh, possible solutions. Yeah, so I, I don't, I don't imagine that we're going to have, you know, I have no idea how we would actually implement a policy that said we had to have population degrowth in British Columbia. Um, I would see globally, in fact, you know, Canada is still seen as, uh, you know, on on the world stage. You know, a world of you know, a place of opportunity. We're a G G twenty G seven country, 
Um, we talk about our world-class sustainable forest management. We talk about the opportunity and the incredibly high standard of living that we that we have here in Canada. Um, I'm not sure that our population is going to go down and I don't know that we'll change our global economic systems, but quite frankly, maybe I can end on the comment that as a G7 and a G20 you know, country, with the land mass that we have given the density of people who live in Canada, if we can't find solutions to these problems, um, you know, I, I really, my eggs are in the Canadian basket. Like we, we have the expertise, we have a very large land mass, we have um, a standard of living that is enviable around the world. Um, we have to be able to find solutions to take care of our own citizens and our land. It, it, it's, I, I feel the onus is on us. Thanks very much. That's a really positive ending to this discussion. I want to thank both our speakers for the way in which they've addressed the uh, cohesion between their comments and the way in which they've addressed questions that all relate to this matter of changing a mindset. The mindset that uh, Doe was raising is that it needs to be changed and which we're all very conscious of. And we're all stumbling around to think exactly how to do it. But we do appreciate the honesty and the professionalism, of what you've told us. And for those of us who are in our dotage, um, you know, it gives us great encouragement to hear people who are on the full-time faculty of the university making these interesting and provocative presentations so we can retire into our emeritus status with the understanding that things are going fine. <laughs> Thank you, Laurie and Nicholas, very much. Thank you.